Let's think now about hemorrhage in children. Now, children are absolutely brilliant compensators. They're able to maintain their blood pressure for long periods of time, despite quite significant hemorrhage. So the first thing in children is we need to try and see how much blood has been lost. So we can look at how bloody the child's jumper is or if there's a pool of blood on the floor or whatever it is, if we can see the blood and that will give us some estimation as to how much blood this child is losing. That's very important in children to get a good history of the particular acute hemorrhage that we're about to investigate and treat. And the primary response that we can see in children to respond to haemorrhage is tachycardia. Now this of course means that you need to know how old your child is and what size your child is and what sort of heart rate you would expect that child to have. So it's not what is the child's overall heart rate, it's is that heart rate tachycardic for that age of child. So we need to know a bit about normal children's parameters. But there is a tachycardic response when children start to lose blood. Their heart rate will become faster than it normally would be. But of course, tachycardia can be caused by the child's pain or the fact that they're frightened or under stress. So the tachycardia in itself is not diagnostic of haemorrhage. And the other signs in children are really somewhat supple, uh, subtle and, and take time to... It takes time to tune into children, really, if you're not used to working with them all the time. So there's fairly subtle signs that we might need to look out for. So there's progressive weakness in the peripheral pulses. So practice feeling normal pulses in children, then you know if you're feeling a weaker one. There's progressive weakening of the peripheral pulses as the child peripherally vasoconstricts as part of their sympathetic compensatory response. And then in children, as we've seen in adults, there's a narrowed pulse pressure. And this can go down to less than 20 millimetres of mercury in children, indicating haemorrhage, the narrow pulse pressure. The reduced difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. And the child will also develop cool extremities. So a good tip is to feel the child centrally, first of all, feel their abdomen or their neck or their chest, and then feel the hands and feet and see if the extremities have become cool. Because again, the cool extremities are indications of peripheral vasoconstriction. Now remember, adults often become cold and clammy. They have a cold sweat as part of the sympathetic response. Well, children, especially young children, don't really do this. What you tend to get in young children is skin mottling. The changes in colour in the skin, but it's kind of a patchy, mottled change. So where adults become cold and clammy, children become mottled. So it's looking at the skin surface for this mottling. And there may also be a dulling in the child's response to pain. So dull response to pain. Now, later signs, and these are very late signs when we're starting to get worried, is the blood pressure drops. So as we've said, children are brilliant compensators if the blood pressure is already dropping, this means the shock is, or if the blood pressure is starting to drop, even by more than a tiny bit, this means actually the child is in a fairly advanced state of shock. So hypotension in a hemorrhaging child is a really significant dangerous clinical feature. And bradycardia is even worse. Bradycardia is an even later sign. Almost you could say that bradycardia is a pre-terminal sign. And if you don't treat them at the bradycardic stage, you really haven't got much time left to save that child's life. And then finally, reduce urine output. Well, you're probably not going to see this acutely. This is the hem if the hemorrhage is more prolonged, then the child can become oliguric. Now I'm just going to sketch out some of the basic principles of management here. And the first thing I want to note is that a child's blood volume is about 80 mils of blood per kilogram of body weight. Now in an emergency situation after a significant haemorrhage, 
you might not have time or the facilities to weigh the child. So you could use one of these charts where you measure how long the child is and then calculate an approximate weight from that. But a, a child's blood volume, we would normally say about 80 mils of blood per kilogram of body weight. And after significant hemorrhage, if the child's tissues are hypoperfused and we're getting these compensatory clinical features, then the initial bolus of fluid, and the fluid needs to be crystalloid and it needs to be warmed. So the initial bolus of warmed crystalloid fluid could be 20 mils of resuscitation fluid per kilogram of the child's body weight as an initial bolus. And then, of course, we need to titrate the response and see what more fluids the child is going to need. Are they responding? Are they responding in a temporary way? Or are they not responding, as we looked at before for the adults? Now, in children, the three-for-one rule does apply. The three-for-one rule does apply, and this means that we might need to be prepared to give up to 60 mils of warmed crystalloid fluid per kilogram of body weight after significant hemorrhage. So be ready to give more warmed crystalloid fluid to titrate according to response. Now this is a very useful graphic for explaining the child's response. This here is the normal start and the child is bleeding. So first of all, we notice that with increasing blood loss, so what we've got along the bottom here is this is 15% blood loss, 30% blood loss, 45% blood loss. What we notice, first of all, is that the heart rate increases fairly steadily. This tachycardic response that we talked about so there's this tachycardic response. And we notice that the blood pressure, which is the red line, goes down a little bit, but basically not at all. I mean, that blood pressure is basically maintained at normal levels up until really significant amounts of blood, like 30% of the blood volume has been lost. Now, cardiac output does start to drop as a result of the hemorrhage because the total blood volume is lower. But basically at this stage, the tachycardia is compensating and maintaining the blood pressure. But then when 30% of the child's blood volume has been lost, first of all, we notice that cardiac output declines. Now it's interesting that cardiac output is declining even though the tachycardia is still increasing. And there's two reasons for this. One is that much more blood has been lost now, and the other is it means that the heart is going to be working less efficiently at these high contractile rates. So the tachycardia continues, but the cardiac output starts to drop. And also by this time, the blood pressure is starting to drop, and the blood pressure will drop off really quite quickly, it can be alarmingly quickly. And then when greater volumes of blood have been lost, like 45%, what we notice now is that the tachycardic response crashes off and we lose the tachycardic compensatory response. And of course that means that the blood pressure and the cardiac output are going to fall to really dangerously low levels. So if a child becomes bradycardic, as we've said, this blue line being the heart rate, that's pretty well a pre-terminal event. So if you do see that, treat it very aggressively with fluid resuscitation. But my fervent hope would be you would be treat treating the child really at a very early stage, preferably at this kind of stage, or certainly at this kind of stage, before we get these dangerous collapses. So remember, brilliant compensation of the blood pressure. This is when we want to be treating these children when the blood pressure is maintained. If the blood pressure starts to fall off, then I think we've already failed. And if the child becomes bradycardic, we've already failed really quite dramatically. So let's look for the early signs and not get anywhere near 
anywhere near this half of the graphic. <laughs>